application and he should be interviewed and interviewed mm -hmm. publicly and so that people can be able to see that indeed the person that is coming forward is a credible uh, person and he has the, is a person who has the requisite mm -hmm. um, experience and is a person of uh, uh, high moral integrity uh, to be able to stand in judgment of other people's lives mm -hmm. and uh, it is there in the, in the constitution uh, but unfortunately mm -hmm. like I've repeatedly stated we don't read uh, as a country our culture is very poor of reading and the politicians even the politicians themselves don't read and those that read they just decide to get uh, to 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 go quiet but what I'm also the reason why I've raised this issue is to remind people that this issue is already addressed in the Constitution and the way we've been doing things is wrong it's not right let's conform to the Constitution with the con let's do things in line with the Constitution because the Constitution says in article 173 to say appointment and promotion to public office must be based on merit now how do you achieve merit if you don't open up the process to the rest to, to competition mm -hmm. and the only way you can do it is to make this the, the process mm -hmm. to be transparent mm -hmm. and so the only way you can ensure that it is transparent is first of all it's the starting point mm -hmm. you should open it up to whoever mm -hmm. feels that a suitable candidate for a particular office uh, to come forward and be subjected to interviews and the Judicial Service Commission should be able to identify the the best candidate mm -hmm. and uh, it is that best candidate that they should now recommend to the president and then the president should now be able to appoint that person and the National Assembly will be asked to ratify that person. It is this process mm -hmm. of identifying the candidate for appointment by the president which is a problem because all what we've been seeing in the past is that you just wake up one morning and you say oh somebody's being sworn in by the president when you don't know how this particular individual was identified what kind of uh, process or scrutiny was subjected to and uh, yes you may have your own uh, uh, investigating wings and so forth which may do some background check but it's not enough mm -hmm. the purpose of this particular process is to ensure that you instill confidence in the people about the pe people that uh, you you restore confidence uh, or you create confidence you build confidence in the institution because where we have coming from one of the legacies of the previous government is the fact that they actually destroyed government institutions but fortunately we have uh, revamped the executive by virtue of the fact that we have elected a new president and a new president has put in a new cabinet we have revamped the uh, legislative branch of government by virtue of the fact that we have a different set of uh, uh, MPs and they have in turn elected a new, uh, a new speaker deputy speaker so those institutions have, have been revamped but I'm not saying that uh, but the problem is that when a system collapses mm -hmm. when a country fails in its governance it's not a failure of one institution mm -hmm. it's the entire institution all the institutions they have failed so if you have to rebuild them you rebuild each and every institution has to be rebuilt and the judiciary plays a critical role and that is why it is important to make sure that we restore people's faith and confidence in the judiciary. Now, it's easy to talk about independence of the judiciary, but uh, how do you grade independence of the judiciary? It is the process, how you, the selection process, how you identify candidates for appointment to the office of judge, that is what will give confidence or integrity, will restore integrity in the system. If the system is transparent, is competitive, it is fair then obviously you're going to get good candidates and all these things are contained in the constitution and my plea is simply to say listen let's just follow what the constitution mm -hmm. provides that is what this issue has been
if this has been part of the Constitution since 2016, yes. in a state council, what is the Minister of Justice not agreeing with you? What is Lars not agreeing you know, with you? Well, it's not that Lars has not agreed with me. I think from the reading of the two statements that came from Lars, my understanding is that uh, they agree with the general principle, but they took issue about certain uh, paragraphs in my letter, which I wrote to the president and copied to the uh, to the Judicial Service Co uh, Commission and copied to Lars itself. Those were the issues where they had. But in principle, in fact, this is not even my suggestion. Yeah. Or it's my plea to say, uh, uh, can we respect the Constitution and do things as provided for in the Constitution? Mm -hmm. That is what my plea has been. Obviously, the ministers come up, I've heard his uh, arguments, and say, well, there is no law. Now, and I'm saying, well, you don't need to put in a new law, but uh, because the Constitution already mandates you to do that. Because if the Constitution says appointments will be based on merit, mm -hmm. how it is not for you to put in place measures to ensure that those appointments are made on merit. Mm -hmm. The Constitution need not need not say more than that okay it is already there the 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 the, the, the constitution is, is is talking about the fact that there has to be fairness in the way public officers um uh, people vie for public officers but even then it's just a matter of common sense anyway you're talking about public office it is public because it is it should be open it is there to serve the people and therefore nobody can claim ownership of that office. We collectively, as a people, can claim ownership of that. Now, if we all collectively own that, then collectively we must have a say on who is to occupy those offices. That is why we elect the president, we elect the councillors, we elect the MPs, because these are public offices. And nobody stopped. If you want to contest the president in 2026, nobody stops you as long as you do your background. I mean, we had 16 uh, presidential candidates. Who stopped them? Yeah. Okay? So that is a transparent system. And then this government is a beneficiary of a transparent uh, electoral system. Because if the system was, 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 was uh, just a sham, most likely they would not be in power today. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the system was transparent and in addition to that people put in various measures. You people are talking about PVT and so forth, you had your uh, election monitoring agents mm -hmm. and all these measures were designed to make sure mm -hmm. that the election is transparent and let the best candidate win the election. Mm -hmm. Now if you can do that to MPs, you do that to presidential candidates and councillors why can't you do that to the other arm of government? To make, we're not saying you have to elect the judges. Fine, maybe that is a route we ought to consider. But the, that would require amendment of the Constitution. But the Constitution currently tells you to say appointment and promotion to public officers must be made on merit, must be made on merit, must be based on merit. Now, how do you ensure that it is based on merit? And it has to be transparent. Now, how do you, sure, do you ensure transparency and fairness to make sure that there was no nepotism here in the selection and in the identification as selection and appointment of a particular person to a public, to a judicial office? It's, it's for me, it's just a matter of logic, really. I mean, I don't even see why this should even be a subject of debate. Even if the Constitution was silent on the matter, you just expect responsible people to do that. You know, but the minister has come out and said there is no law. My point is that, okay, let's assume you're right. What stops you from putting in place a law? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is a provision in, uh, in, the in the Judicial Service Commission Act, Section 14, which says that the Judicial Service Commission, working together with the minister, can formulate mm -hmm. rules or regulations on how to implement the provisions of the act in a more effective manner. Even tomorrow, 
the minister and the judicial service commission they can formulate regulations which would provide for advertisement and everything to provide at the end of the day it doesn't matter what you do the objective is to make sure that you come up with a system that is transparent credible and that ensures that it ensures fairness okay so that the best candidate is allowed is identified and appointed to the office state council you know there's no doubt that it's almost impossible mm -hmm. to remove a judge, mm -hmm. to remove a chief justice until the retirement age, you know, is facilitated. Does this strengthen your argument? Does this strengthen what the Constitution is saying? Yes, of course. I mean, the, 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 and this is why we must even expect a lot more from our, from the people we identify as judges okay they must be able to pass through a very stringent process which is transparent which is fair and so that we identify the best brains the best people with the best experience to occupy to these of to occupy these offices the reason for that is unlike politicians uh, judges enjoy security of tenure mm -hmm. So meaning that unless you are found that you've bribed some, you've been bribed or you, you misconduct yourself in a very serious manner, you are basically guaranteed to be in the office until you are 70. Yeah. The earliest you can live is 65. So, which means that because your tenure is guaranteed, then it means that you must be able to meet the highest standard possible. These people should be subjected to the highest standard. Uh, of, they must be able to meet very, very stringent uh, standards to make sure that only deserving candidates occupy those offices. Because you can't afford to make a mistake. Okay, you can't afford to make a mistake. If, let's say, you pick up a person that is not supposed to be in that office, that person will be there. But by the time the system is catching up and you are removing him, that person will have already done a lot of damage in the process. But it's only fairness. I have never seen a country that is opposed to meritocracy. I mean, it's shocking. I have you, mediocrity has never built a country. Mediocrity just produces wastage and corruption. Okay, so it is imperative that is we have to move towards a system that celebrates merit as opposed to incompetence and corruption. Okay, so and the only way we can do that is to revamp the system. You know, it's one thing for the president to say, oh, I'm all for the rule of law, I'm all for the independence of the judiciary, but the question is, how are you promoting rule of law? Okay, and the critical institution, the institution that is critical for the maintenance of rule of law, is the judiciary. Mm. So that judiciary must be independent, must be in the, uh, and the independence comes from the manner in which you appoint your officer, mm. your, those of of uh, you appoint people to that office. Because remember, corruption is not just about yeah. you receiving bribes; it is also about you occupying an office that you know very well you don't qualify to occupy. It's also about you occupying an office which you know that subjected to scrutiny, I'll, I'll fail, okay? You're already corrupt. Yeah. So you are basically owned by the appointing authority. But once you go through that process of selection, it is opened. You are openly interviewed and your whole life is turned upside down. And that notwithstanding, you come up on top. You even feel proud of yourself to say, I got appointed to this office on merit, mm -hmm. not because uh, it in my appointment didn't come out as a, as a, as a favor. Mm -hmm. And that person is independent, mm -hmm. is not owned by anyone. And that is what you need in the judiciary. And at the end of the so you won't care whether it is the president, it is what, it is the president's relative or what, you'll be able to stand on the law. Right. But when you get a person that is corrupt or that is incompetent, that is not supposed to be there, he's always mindful mm -hmm. because he knows that he doesn't, like there's a saying that you can't, uh, uh, what, what is the saying? To say you can't beat the finger that uh, feeds you or yeah, yeah, something like that. But we want judges 
uh, that are independent. Now, also the president, whatever he's talking about, is, is um, I mean, <laughs> sometimes, you know, these pronouncements are easier made than, uh, there is, there, it's easy to make because it becomes an illusion to think that you can, uh, you can develop a country with a weak judiciary. Right. It's an illusion. Okay, one of the reasons that people must be able to interrogate is why did the system collapse under PF? Very simple, because because the PF packed the system with people that were not supposed to be there, and the system collapsed. So we need to reverse that. And you know, even when the president talks about new dawn, what what is that? Yeah. When you say new dawn, what is that? What would you like to see? Well, new dawn means a new way of doing things. Right. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are saying, okay, we're in darkness. Now we are in light. It means you cannot say it's a new dawn administration when you continue to do the same thing that mm -hmm. your predecessor actually did. Okay, now what is new about that? Mm -hmm. Okay, the new dawn would require um, a new direction. I don't think other people on 12th August voted for continuity. Mm. I don't think that they voted for continuity. Or well, they voted to say where there is green, you put red. Mm. They voted for a radical okay. change okay. in, the, in yeah. the direction of yeah. the country, new way of doing things. And new way of doing things would mean appointing people on merit. Mm not on account of uh, political convenience on how they'll be able to serve the government in power. It means the president being, um, first of all, putting the interests of the country first ahead of his own interest. Okay, it, is, it means that the president being impersonal, because the experience in the last 56 years has proven that every president has tried to manipulate the constitution, has tried to manipulate the laws in order to ensure that they have an advantage and possibly even increase their stay in office. No president has tried to be impersonal and be able to say, my interests are insignificant and I should give priority to the interests of the country. That has never been the trend. And that is why 56 years after independence, we are still struggling. We are still a, a, a poor country. It's, 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 yeah. a, it's a big shame. This is the first time you've raised this issue. This issue. You've raised this issue in relation to Concord. You know, judges, you know, that some of them mm. were not suitable, they're not mm -hmm. qualified. Mm -hmm. They're still in office. Yeah. Still yeah. office. Yeah. Is it enough, really, just to point out the shortcomings and nothing has been done? And this is a two pronged uh, in a question state council. In addition to that, let's assume this government, the mm. president, mm -hmm. doesn't stick to what the constitution is saying mm -hmm. and goes ahead mm -hmm. and nominates the chief the justice. Can you reconcile all this? I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yes, yes I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. it's, 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 life is about choices. Okay, you get to live with the choices you make. So my job and, uh, I mean, uh, your job and mine is, uh, we're in a privileged position. Our job is simply to, uh, to sound yeah. the warning. Yeah. When something is wrong, we must be able to point it out. And in doing so, we're not saying that we, we have the sum total for the human knowledge. Mm -hmm. But what we're asking for, for is that let's have a conversation on this mm. because i am of the view this is my opinion and i'm saying we are not following what the constitution says mm. okay now nobody is saying uh what i'm suggesting violates the constitution mm. nobody's saying that i haven't heard anybody mm. say that mm. and i don't even see how something so fundamental as introducing competition uh, merit in a system would be against the constitution. Mm -hmm. It should just be crazy. But for me, it's a no-brainer. You don't even need a constitution to tell you. Mm -hmm. This is something that anybody that is driven by the interests of his own country mm -hmm. will be able to introduce. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you, you, know the, you know one of the problems we have had over the years mm -hmm. is that if you check the constitution of 1964, to the current constitution now, as amended in 2016, you find that the current constitution is so voluminous. Okay, it's so voluminous. It's longer. Okay, it has more pages. I think we're talking about 200 and something 
articles. Whereas the independence constitution was a very small constitution, which with just about maybe a hundred or so uh, articles. The reason was simple. At independence, there was a theory that the constitution need not go into details. Or what it has to do is to provide this general framework of, of, of the power of, of government and then let the details be contained in an act of parliament, in regulations, and judges who come forward supplement it with decisions where they interpret. But the truth of the matter is that that particular theory has been proven to be wrong because the judiciary has not stepped forward in terms of giving flesh to the constitutional framework and the politicians have been shown that they have not passed laws that would beef up the constitution as a result we have had a problem now the modern way and what we have adopted now is to say no 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 we don't trust the judges we don't trust the politicians let's put all the, let's make the constitution as reasonably detailed as is necessary Okay, that is why you now have a constitution telling you to say uh, appointment should be based on merit. I mean, you didn't need the constitution to yeah. tell you that. You know, if if let's say, I mean, I I gave somebody an example to say, uh, even in my own law firm, I employ young lawyers. What I do is that I send a letter to some of the universities and I say, can you give me? Your top five students from this university, UC University, and then even if let's say I'm just looking for 10, I'll have maybe 30 students. But from that 30, I pick up the best 10. Because I don't want the headaches. I don't want the, the headaches of having to struggle with people who can, who, whose performance is below par. Okay? So if we can do that in a private institution, what more in a public institution? So the standards should even be higher. You know, because of the damage which the people in public office will do. In a private setting, the damage is limited, okay? Because whatever mistakes these uh, uh, lawyers would make, it is localized within my yeah. firm. But when a public officer makes a mistake, that mistake will affect the entire country. And that is why there is a higher standard. Uh, a lot is expected. And I don't see why anybody reasonable who means well for this country would actually oppose, uh, would defy what the Constitution provides. This issue which is in the Constitution, and I agree with you, you know, it will facilitate the base person to be the head mm -hmm. of the judiciary. And it will go a long way to facilitating even partial independence of the, the judiciary. What else should be done or mm -hmm. could be done to ensure that the judiciary is totally independent? I say this because mm. some people are saying it's impossible to have the judiciary independent, mm -hmm. especially when it's not even adequately you know, funded. Mm -hmm. you know, you're depending solely on, on the government. It, I'm asking this question because you've alluded to the importance of the judiciary mm -hmm. and it is important to ensure that it is independent. Mm -hmm. How can we achieve that or strive towards that? Yeah, you see, the starting point is the, append the appointment process. First of all, I mean, you know, the failure in Zambia over the last 56 years has, the, has not been failure of institutions, has been failure of human beings. Okay? You can put in place the best constitution you can think of, but if you put rogues in office to run the system, it won't work because they'll corrupt the system. It's as basic as that. Because the institution will mirror yeah. the people. Okay? You pick up decent men and women to run the institutions. Even if the framework, the constitutional framework is weak, they'll still be able to do their jobs, irrespective of the fact that the institutions are weak. Now, if you pick, if you choose somebody who is a thief, you put controls there, but you still find a way to break the system and steal, because it's in him. You pick up a person of high moral standing who believes that stealing is bad, even if the institutions are weak, 
he will not take advantage. He will not steal, no, uh, not because he doesn't have the opportunity. He will not steal. He will not steal, not because the law says you steal, you go to jail. But it's part of his values. Mm -hmm. He doesn't believe that there should be. Uh, it should be stealing it from in, in his office. So at the end of the day, institutions reflect the people. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking for an independent judiciary, you need to find independent-minded people to be judges. Mm -hmm. So you can't. It will be a con and how do you identify independent-minded judges? Mm -hmm. Is by having a transparent appointment process, selection process, mm -hmm. and appointment process. But. If the system is hidden, mm -hmm. nobody knows how people are identified because that is already a system is already corrupt mm -hmm. in the in the first place, and that system will never give you independent-minded judges, and the, it will also not result in an independent judiciary. It's basically, I mean, it's 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 it's, it's a no-brainer. You don't need to be a genius to be able to. Um, to create such a, a, a causal connection between, between the two. The other point that needs to be noted is this. This is not a new issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a new issue. I first raised this issue in 2016. Yeah. In 2016, I was one of those people that were very excited about the fact that, oh, we're going to have a constitutional court. Because our system was such that um, uh, judges, mm -hmm. there was no specialization. You have a judge today, in the morning is attending to a criminal matter, in the afternoon is dealing with a civil matter, tomorrow is dealing with a, a, a matter to do with divorce, the other day is dealing with a matter to do with contract. So at the end of the day, our judges were jacks of all trade. Mm -hmm. Then we are now saying, so no, no, there has to be some level of specialization. Mm -hmm. And that is why I celebrated when I, when I saw that we had created we had made provision mm -hmm. for the creation of a constitutional court because then this was going to be a specialized court to deal with matters of public law, matters of governance. Mm -hmm. This is a special. So you have judges who do nothing, simply study the constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay? We needed a team like that. And when the time came for appointing these judges, I was privileged to receive their CVs and other documents by virtue of the fact that at least I belong to this small group of uh, senior lawyers mm. for state council. So therefore, Lars would then, the Law Association of Zambia was able to send the documents for us to review and be able to give our comments to the, uh, uh, to the, to the National Assembly. That's how I ended up seeing these documents. And I said, I looked at the CVs. And I looked at the, their qualifications, and this is my opinion, by the way, mm. and uh, my conclusion was that, no, all these people did not meet the qualifications. Yeah. And what did I do? I wrote a letter to the president. Yeah. Mr. President, your nominees do not meet the, requir the requirements mm. set by the Constitution. It was nothing personal. Some of those people that were nominated, in fact, were, some of them were my students. I taught them at the university. Some of them were my colleagues. I worked with them at the university. And it wasn't personal. My commitment is to the Constitution. Okay, I, I, I've, I don't care even if you are my friend or whatever, but my, I have greater loyalty to the Constitution than to individuals because when you respect the Constitution, everything else will flow from there and you'll have a more sensible and uh, a better working environment so that you and I can celebrate. But the outcome of that exercise, the President did not even bother to acknowledge my letter, I didn't, and the process went, went on. Now, I made various representations thereafter, and nothing happened, okay, and more judges were actually appointed. In fact, President Lungu appointed more judges Absolutely. than any other judge, yeah. uh, than any other president in the history of this country. And he, he, he presided over the most radical transformation of our judicial uh, system in, 50, in, uh, in uh, more than 50 years, okay, because during his tenure, we introduced uh, two other courts. From 1964, 1973, we, are, we only had two superior courts, the High Court and the Supreme Court. It was initially the Court of Appeal, then it became the Supreme Court. Now, in 2016, we introduced two additional superior courts, yeah. which were now the Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. So basically, we doubled the number of uh, courts, and that 
radically transformed it and also we increased the numbers of judges. Now this was a most radical transformation of the judiciary and care should have been taken in doing this process. So when the president did not act on that, then I, after I realized that this man is not going to listen, and I stopped. Now, the reason I have brought up this issue now, my, ex my thinking is that we have a new government. Maybe this government will act where the previous government failed. Maybe we have a more listening president than the previous uh, president. You remember, I think we talked about it when I said, when he asked me in a previous interview to say, how do you grade this government? And I said, give me 90 days or 100 days, yeah. we'll come and review. We have done 60. We have done 60. Yeah. So I think after, say, after another 30, I think we'll, I'll be, we'll, come, we'll, back. we'll come back and then be able to, to, to make an assessment. Let's talk about these radical changes that were made to the judiciary. Mm -hmm. One of the replications of it is because we start with most of these judges. I don't want to be cited. I'm not saying you know all of them are bad. I'm just no, saying. No, nobody's suggesting nobody's that all of them, all of them, yeah. like in every other setting, yeah. you find good people. We're not saying that the entire all, yeah. all, all the all the judges they are they are bad people. Yeah. They are corrupt. No, we're not saying that. Yeah. What we are saying is that because the system is porous, yeah. is murky, and is opaque, yeah. we have allowed people that who should not have been Absolutely. there to be judges. So what is the replication? And in saying so, you talked about the introduction of the, the Concord. Can the Concord be done away with? No, no, yeah. <laughs> There's been people, people have, have argued, I know I read an article by yeah. some of my uh, former students at the University of Zambia who are now lecturers there. They advocated for the fact, no, we should go the Kenyan way and just uh, uh, get rid of them and yeah. ask them to uh, apply and so forth. I'm a firm believer that we need to find a Zambian solution, not mm -hmm. a Kenyan solution. Yeah. Whatever was done in Kenya may have worked in Kenya because there are various economic, social, and political forces at play in Kenya which favored, which gave birth to that system. We need to find a Zambian solution. Okay, we need first of all to understand why are we in this mess. Okay, then once we understand the mess, then we need to prescribe a Zambian solution. I don't believe in uplifting experiences from another country and you replicate it in your own country and you expect that it will work. Most likely they don't work because of the differences in the environment. Yes, I would not isolate one court, the constitutional court, say so this is a problem. What I'm advocating for is a complete overhaul of our judicial mm -hmm. system, and not just the judicial system, but also of the entire constitutional order, because we are in dire need of revamping our constitutional framework. Mm -hmm. We need to complete this constitution-making exercise, because at, every, at, at each and every stage, the constitution-making process has been aborted, mm -hmm. purely out of the greed of the politicians. Mm -hmm. So. I would suggest that we address these issues within the general framework of the overhaul as we are overhauling, overhauling the, 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 the entire constitution. I'll be reluctant to begin to identify um, uh, say this court is a problem, this court is a problem. Now I wouldn't do that, but what we need to do is to, over, to analyze the entire uh, constitutional order and I believe that it is in that need of uh, redress because we didn't finish the constitution-making exercise. We amended the constitution in 2016, which was just the face-to-face. -face. The second phase was supposed to go to a referendum. That referendum collapsed. So we needed to go through the, uh, the, because we still have the issue unresolved to do with the Bill of Rights and other provisions which were not touched. So that is why it is imperative to be able to revisit this particular process, except that this time we do things differently. There are already calls to say the next constitution-making exercise, which is imperative, should not be driven by government, but should be driven by people, or people outside government, an idea which I support. Okay, so that is what is required to be done, and that is why I was taken aback when the president says uh, constitution making is not a priority. And I said, well, I mean, this is very strange because it should be a priority. Because it's everything. Because it is everything. It lay, you, you lay down the foundation. Yeah. It is your foundation. 
You know, it's like saying, if you say the constitution is not priority, it's like you're building a house in, in, in the air. Okay, you can't. And you cannot run a country in a vacuum. It needs to be anchored in a strong constitutional framework. So that is a priority because uh, his, his argument is that, well, I need to, 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 to address the economy as a priority. Granted. But you can't fix the economy in a vacuum. Absolutely. One of the things that I don't think that the president understands and appreciates, I don't think that he has interrogated why the economy collapsed in the first place. The economy collapsed because the collapse of the economy does not happen in isolation. The starting point is to destroy the institutions first. Once you destroy the institutions, then the economy becomes it goes into free fall. Now, so therefore, it means you cannot rebuild the economy without rebuilding the institutions Absolutely. that support it. You say one, what might work in Kenya may not work mm -hmm. in Zambia. Mm -hmm. People say, okay, again, they haven't read the, mm -hmm. the constitution that what is happening in South Africa, they're going mm -hmm. through the same, mm -hmm. more or less similar. Mm -hmm. You know, um, are there similarities? to what is happening in South Africa or also yeah. advertised. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think the concept just a No, no, the concept is okay. Yeah. I mean the concept is okay. It's all about transparency. Yeah. Okay, because they have also learned because if you look back, going back to nineteen ninety four, when uh apartheid ended, uh judges <coughs> the way they were appointed then is not the way they are being appointed now. They have changed. They've also learned. Okay, there were no in '94 when judges were being appointed. There were no public hearings, to the best of my recollection. Anyway, I'm not trying to claim to be uh, uh, knowledgeable about the history and development in South Africa. But Zambia can comment because I live here. But given the little limited knowledge that I have, I don't think that the way judges were appointed in '94 mm -hmm. is the same way that is being done yeah. in 20. Uh, 21. Okay, because they're also trying to grapple with the issue of transparency and making sure that you choose the best candidate. Mm. Because nothing should be static. We can't go on doing the same thing. I mean, that is basically what madness is all about. You do the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Tell me, Mr. Council, why is this country, you know, um, edgy? Maybe that's the right way about progressive change. I say this because if whoever was there before knew what this constitution is saying about picking the base candidate, maybe that could not have been inserted in there. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they didn't read. Mm -hmm. yeah. but my question is, what are they afraid of? Progressive change mm. to get the best. Mm. Mm. I mean, I'm not talking about this government, I'm talking about if governments in general, some of the people hold very critical position mm. and picked by a president mm. who's got so much power mm. to pick from mm -hmm. from the base mm. doesn't do that. Yeah. I mean, that's the sad part. I think you and I are old enough to remember the first cabinet that President Chilo yeah. appointed. Yeah. 91 to 95. Yeah. It had the best brains Absolutely. in the country. I think you can get it. Yeah. It had the best uh, yeah. brains. You had all your doctors, all your professors, <laughs> yeah. and they were placed in the right. Even the deputy minister level. That's right. Really you had people with yeah. proven track record and everything else. And these were the people who were able to guide the country throughout the privatization process, the IMF programs, and everything else. It was a difficult time. But they steered the country. And as it turned out, I think of all the ministers, <laughs> the entire cabinet, the president was the least educated. Mm. President yeah. was the least educated. Yeah. Okay? But the point is that he was not intimidated. He knew. He got his mandate from the yeah. people. And he chose people that knew more than he did. Mm. And that is what leadership is all about. Being president doesn't mean that you have to know everything. Mm. No, it is about also acknowledging the fact that I don't know everything. And there are people that know something better than I do, which is the case anyway. And it is about being able to tap into the knowledge and the experience that our Zambians have in order to develop this country. A country will never develop based on mediocrity. It will never develop. 
And that is why we're coming from a situation where the entire country is being run by cadres. Yeah. Now we are waking up to say, how did we find ourselves yeah. in this situation? Yeah. Okay? And my expectation is that this new government will be able to change course. But I guess the jury is still out. We have to wait 90 days. I think 90 days or 100 days, I think I'll be able to authoritatively share my thoughts on this particular issue, whether the government is, is, is going in the right direction or not. We'll be going on a short break. And then when we come back, we spend just 10 minutes on corruption and how this government is handling issues. You know what I mean? to make questions but we'll, we'll try and just summarize in in turn you know in 15 minutes but before we do that could you also clarify a constitutional issue which is the reason you know recently so many issues you know were coming up in such a short in a period this relates to whether the president has got the powers to supervise the security um, institutions like DEC, mm. ACC mm. Could you clarify yeah. that? Because yeah. the vice president gave a statement, mm. the press assistant also gave mm. a statement which which is very confusing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, again it boils down to this thing. You know, one of the things we need to understand is that we're not dealing with a banana republic. Okay? This is a country that has I mean, like I've, I've said, shared my thoughts with other people, is that we have more than a century of government, of a Western style of government, more than a century. We spent 65 years under colonial rule. Now, during that colonial rule from 1899 to 1964, we built a government, we built a system of government which was passed on to the uh, post-independence government, which was on the base of which the post-independence government was based. Okay, so over the years we have developed, and there's been other developments in the last 56 years. I think what is required is I think people, even the leaders, I mean this is where the problem is. When you're a leader, uh, I think you ought to be slow to open your mouth. Okay, make sure that you've got, you have been briefed properly on an issue before you open your mouth because uh, your word as a leader is not that of a common man, okay? Especially when it comes to the president. Because most people look at it, whatever comes out of the mouth of the president, basically is policy. Absolutely. It's policy. Yeah. That is why a president cannot afford to make a, a careless, uh, 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 he cannot afford to make a misstatement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the choice of words coming from the president's mouth must be measured and must be must be clear and unambiguous we don't need to start debating as to what the president meant when he said this the message must be clear and but unfortunately again maybe we give them the 30 day period and the 100 days period 100 day period to be able to 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 uh, to imagine that they're still trying to find their feet but whatever transpired it's a it's complete is something that is very unfortunate mm. because a simple reading of the constitution would have shown clearly that what they were talking about is not tenable. Mm. Even some opposition leaders jumped onto it. No, the president should not take deck under his control. Mm. The president cannot do that. Yeah. These and this is where I give credit to to by the way, this may sound strange coming out of my mouth. Yeah. I give credit to President Lungu. Mm. Because what he did in 2016 was to cede some of the powers of the office of president. He gave away some of the powers. And like we said, I don't think that they had read before they signed it into law. <laughs> that is why after they signed it, they now started looking, where's the Absolutely. office of the, of the deputy minister, only to realize that there is no deputy minister. Yeah. So they didn't read. But we are beneficiaries of that, of their own ignorance and inability to read. But what that amendment did was it took away a lot of the powers of the president and vested them in independent institutions. Now, there are several independent institutions created. You now have the Judicial Complaints Commission, you have the Judicial Service Commission, you have the Anti-Corruption Commission, you have, uh, the, the, there are several. Mm -hmm. One may argue these institutions existed before 2016. Yes, they did. But they were created under an act of parliament. Yeah. But now here, they've been given a constitutional status. Mm -hmm. 
okay they have been elevated so they derive their existence not from an act of parliament now from the constitution and the constitution declares these institutions to be independent mm. nobody can tell mm. these institutions on what mm. to do so therefore it is a myth to suggest that these institutions can be brought under mm. the control of the president that would amount to a violation of the constitution and the president does not even have the powers to do so in fact if he attempted to do so that would even amount to violation of the constitution for which it would be liable for to impeachment so that is again a non-start is something that was clearly forced and the people in status could not explain it properly the vice president could not express it uh, explain it properly and all what they wanted was to praise the president needlessly so and yet the issue was very simple they could have simply said no it is not true yeah the president has not brought DEC and the FIC and other institutions under his control. He cannot do that. He has no intention to do that. He can only do that if he amends the constitution and he has no intention of amending the constitution. Full stop. There would have been absolutely no debate that went on about the fact that he's taken over this institution, that institution. That was all a product mm -hmm. of people's inability to read. Yeah. And you cannot develop a country without a culture of reading and especially when it comes to legal issues you have to be slow to act check the law first what does it say before you open your mouth or before you even take a step i'm talking to uh, state council john sangra on uh, frank on camlet been delving into uh, you know, judicial issues when we come back we just spend maybe 10 minutes just to look at how this government is handling the one key issue the fight against corruption john is very shortly africa is rising to a new dawn of integrity and accountability are you tired of being swindled or buying fake or illegal properties would you like to sell or buy genuine property would you like to list your property on both local and international market don't waste your time call the professionals the sgk properties on plus two six zero seven six two one six six zero one Eight. SGK Properties. Your business assurance is our priority. Are you a small to medium enterprise looking to advertise your products and services within your community and across Zambia? In these economic times, we are here to help you grow your business. Advertise with us on Camnet Market. Camnet Market is offering lower rates for prime time advertising between 06 to 18 hours every day to give your business an edge under the new normal and beyond. For more details, contact us on the following numbers. 097-975-3010 or 096-296-5883 as well as 096-244-726 You can also reach us via email on info at camnetvafrica.com Camnet TV, not just another channel. This is Frank and Kamala, my guest in the world, John Sangwa, State Council. We'll be delving, we'll be delving into issues of uh, judiciary vis a vis whether the position of Chief Justice should be advertised or not. SC has made it very clear it is actually in the Constitution. What is AC saying? Read, read, read. In the last 10 minutes or so, we have you know, State Council. You know, we can't delve into all the governance issues first. It's only 60 days, but there's one issue that is on top of the agenda of people, and that really, to an extent, facilitated this change. The lack of rule of law, corruption. Are you confident that this government can do a lot to address this and how and what you've heard so far does it give you hope that corruption can be addressed on the flip side of that are we expecting too much as a people the 2.8 mm. 
who voted is 1.8 million that voted for this government mm. yeah uh, maybe my statement might be premature but the indications so far they don't give me that kind of confidence yeah. uh, because I would have expected the president for example to have made changes at certain institutions yeah. um, for example I don't see how uh, institution like DC Dragon mm -hmm. uh, was his uh, anti-corruption commission uh, which by the way existed during President Lungu's tenure yeah. uh, where the period we are complaining about to say there was massive corruption yeah. I don't see how the same institution can actually fight the corruption address the challenges that have arisen in the same condition that it is in mm -hmm. I, I have my misgivings but at the very least because the president has um, the discretion uh, to appoint the aides and the commissioners that mm -hmm. for these institutions for example he has the power I stand to be corrected to appoint the DG of the anti-corruption commission as well as the commissioners of the anti-corruption commission and um, DG intelligence yeah, and, uh, yes DG inte yeah. intelligence I don't want to comment because yeah. I have very little knowledge about that but these are the law enforcement uh, agencies uh, but the point that is there is um, what President uh, Lungu succeeded in doing is to undermine these institutions yeah. and the undermining came at two levels first of all they were underfunded mm. okay and then because you're underfunded you can't recruit the best the best brains anyway because you're not competing for the same manpower that with the private sector mm. so you have already have a problem and as a result of that um, you now make sure that uh, you staff these institutions with people who are not supposed to be there so clearly you can't have merit based you can't have uh, efficiency and competence in these institutions mm -hmm. you know because what is required is a robust uh, to is a revival of these institutions okay for example one of the fundamental questions is um, this corruption we're talking about when did it happen okay it happened in the last 10 years mm -hmm. so where was DEC where was ACC in the last 10 years what did they do okay they can't say they were prevented no it would not be right because they are independent yeah. so if 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 let's say they didn't do it means they failed to do their job yeah. if they failed to do their job then why do you want to keep them okay that is the the, the, the the problem because the president's hands are tied in a way and uh, I mean uh, I didn't set out to do to bash the president but I think when there is need we have to be truthful and say things that are correct and when they are wrong also we need to to state these things correctly the problem with uh, the situation as it is the president's hands are tied mm -hmm. Uh, I was reminding people that given the structure of the Constitution the president cannot even summon the head of the Drug Enforcement Commission mm -hmm. he cannot even have a conversation yeah. with the director general of the SEC he can't even say let's have a meeting let's discuss how your institution is working that would be interference right. and that would be a breach of the Constitution mm -hmm. he can't do that he cannot even do that to the SEC okay so when there is failure of ACC to address the issues of corruption and everything else that failure technically is not the president's failure it is the failure of these institutions okay because they're the ones with the constitutional mandate to be able to do the investigations and everything else and I'm not one that would encourage that the president gets involved in the investigations and I don't believe that the president should even make public statements about ongoing investigations because we went through this particular period I was explaining to somebody that uh, in uh, 2000 2001 2002 and 3 we had a situation whereby President Manawasa went to the National Assembly and made his wild allegations against his predecessor but 
this was even before any investigations were done. But of course the law then was different from what it is. So currently we need to learn from that mistake because we also don't want to poison the chances of people receiving a fair hearing. Mm -hmm. It is very important. So it is important for the system to be effective in such a way that those that are guilty should be uh, prosecuted and convicted. Those that are innocent should be prosecuted and acquitted. That's a fair system. Okay, but it is important that we revamp these institutions. Okay, if let's say we need to acknowledge the fact that if our two investigations are slow, it is not the president's fault. Yeah. It is the pre is the fault of these institutions. Yeah. Again, being slow is relative. Okay, how fast do you want? Again, we're not suggesting that you just start rounding up everybody in PF, you round them up just because you need to prosecute somebody. No, you investigate first. And then based on where the evidence leads you, you make a determination whether to arrest somebody or not. I think these are the issues that we need to take into account. These cases can be very complicated. Yes. You know, state council. Mm -hmm. Should the government call on experts, you know, from corporate partners? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, in a situation like this, you can't have too much, okay? If there's a chance. Uh, the other point is that, you see, if you have chance to get help from a more developed country that have dealt with these issues, better investigating techniques and everything else, uh, there's no harm in getting these people on board, provided it is done within the framework of the law. There is absolutely nothing wrong. You know, it's like... Uh, uh, when you go through this process, it's like having a funeral. Who gets invited to a funeral? Mm -hmm. Nobody gets invited. Nobody gets turned away from a funeral. So if other countries, uh, other institutions came forward to say, we'd like to help you in your fight against corruption, I think that would be perfectly in order, in my opinion, provided we did within uh, the existing legal framework. You know, so it could be in terms of funding, it could be in terms of uh, expertise. Another country can send, okay, guys, um, uh, because we have to understand there are limitations, and that's why we're talking about experience and so forth. Okay, I've been practicing law for the last 30 years, uh, for more than 30 years now the kind of things I have seen is not, are not things that somebody Absolutely. who five years at the bar has actually seen. And that is where the experience comes in. But I'm not saying that I'm better than the other person, yeah. yeah. But except that I'll have seen more and I'll have experienced more. So if we can get help, it is necessary, but that help has to be given within the existing legal framework of the Republic of Zambia. Is the way President Ichleman is government handle corruption going to have a bearing on the quality of the leadership, the management? Oh yes, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, the, the people voted PF out on the premise that it was the most corrupt regime ever. Okay, so how he, so it's not like he has a choice in the matter, he doesn't have a choice because this is the mandate that people gave him. So at the end of the day, how, he, how the, the, the issue of corruption is handled during the life of his tenure uh, will have a bearing on his entire uh, leadership. Okay, because we have a problem and I think there is, there is this talk about the fact that there was corruption, there was a corruption, fine. Um, what is important, first of all, is that we would like to know what was the extent of the corruption. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's one thing to say there was corruption, it's another thing for you to give numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, for me, I'd be interested in numbers. Yes, during this 10 year period, how much money did we lose? Yeah. Did we lose 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, or whatever? What is the figure? Okay, that is important. The next question is that once you identify, is uh, the next thing will be okay how do we recover this money because it's important that the money is recovered yep. yeah because that will be the only way it will be fair but all these things considered uh, you know these are what we call deliverables mm -hmm. when the president comes 26 2026 yeah. so they'll be like a scorecard yeah. how well did you do on corruption yeah. how much of our money did you recover First of all, how much money was stolen, yeah. okay, and how much of it did you recover? 
These are important questions. Okay, you can say, oh, we are, for, we, are, we are fighting corruption. What, what, what? That is just talk. In your fight against corruption, what did you reach, achieve? That those are the issues that... Tell me, as the... I mean, this is in what I'm hearing, and as a media person, that there's a sense of confidence or arrogance from those perceived to have committed crime in mm. the previous you know, you know, you know, government. Are they seeing, smelling some weakness in the way the, 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 these cases are being handled or it's false confidence? Well, <laughs> I mean, the only one who, who should portray confidence is a person who has done no wrong. Mm -hmm. If you haven't stolen, you have nothing to worry about. Yeah. Okay, I would, I would hold my head very high and I'll say, I haven't stolen. Bring evidence of the fact that I have stolen. Okay, so if somebody has to be confident, it should be those that know they are clean. Every amount of money they have, whatever property they have, they'll be able to account for it properly. I don't think that those have any, any reason to worry. But I think when you know that you didn't acquire these things properly and you have confidence that you will not be arrested and prosecuted, then that is false confidence. And the other point also to remember is that, by the way, there's no statute of limitation on crime. Mm -hmm. eh? Okay, you can stay there for 20 years, you'll still be arrested. Absolutely. And I always remind people when we are doing this case to do with uh, President Chiloba, we, we, we always used to say a crime is committed when it is committed. Yeah. What you do subsequently doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You kill somebody today, that person has died today. What you do with the body subsequently is inconsequential, mm. okay? So you can try and bury the body, do this, do that. The crime has already been committed today. If you put your hands in, uh, your, in, the, in government coffers today, mm. it's just a matter of time. All what it will require is some meticulous person to go follow the paper trail and you'll be identified. Tell me. I go back to the issue of expecting. I mean, the people are mm -hmm. expecting a lot. Information comes to play here. Would you like regular information disseminated, mm -hmm. you know, to the people? I'm glad the president will be on radio, you know, tomorrow. Having confirmed uh, this announcement that if it's true, great stuff, he'll be on uh, radio tomorrow, you know, uh, answering in, in equations. What is your take on how? communication information should flow. Yeah, but you see the, the, the problem we have in our system is that uh, every minister speaks for government mm -hmm. and in the process you have chaos. Okay? The, the information is good to be relayed to the people but it has to be a proper channel. To it. Yeah, it has to be coordinated. It has to be channeled properly. You have every minister is able to have a press conference, make these wild promises and so forth. But one of the things that these ministers forget is that they are not their own bosses. Mm -hmm. The boss remains the president. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they are delegates of the president. So when you open your mouth, you are technically committing the president mm -hmm. to that agenda. Okay, so it is, whilst it is important to convey, to communicate information, you have to check the quality of the information, the accuracy of that information. It's not about communicating information for the sake of it. It has to be information that is of value to the people. I mean, I wouldn't mind a situation where you have one government spokesperson. Which there, Somebody, is, which there is a, a minister of information. Well, no, no, yeah, but that is duplication because you only have one government. Okay. Okay, so. You're what, saying just an independent. It, but I mean, you could have yeah. somebody, uh, say, for example, you have somebody, even take somebody, because the person you have at State House, I mean, this is the chaos you have, yeah. is, uh, is working at State House, whoever it is, is at State House, is, uh, I don't know what the title is, is... Um, is a press secretary for press and public relations. And yeah, for, for, for the president. Now, yeah. okay, fine. You, special assistant. Special assistant. Yeah. Now, the point is that, is this at a personal level or at government level? Mm -hmm. Okay? This is the confusion. But the other point is this, if he's acting for the, he's speaking for the president in an official capacity, mm -hmm. 
one of the things that must also be realized is that the ministers speak to the for the president mm -hmm. so what is supposed to happen is that really you don't need your ministers talking if there is an issue for instance yeah. if there is an issue to do with health for instance mm -hmm. the pronouncement should still come from state house yeah. except that the personal status must be able to get a brief from the relevant minister Amazing. on the ground yeah. so that uh, they have the correct information so that when it is given remember they are speaking on behalf of the yeah. president so you can't have so many people speaking on behalf of the president these ministers don't speak for themselves they do not have mandate they are delegates of the president mm. they work for the president on top, they, on top of that you have even another person at the party Yes, that, that is now another chaotic system. Yeah. So you, you now have uh, Minister of Information, who is the, I don't know whether it's the government spokesperson. Government spokesperson. And then you have somebody at state house, another spokesperson. Each ministry has its own uh, spokesperson. It's just chaotic. Yeah. And yet you only have one government. Yeah. And then the other point to remember is that the power, the executive power of the republic is vested in one man. Yeah. That is the president. Yeah. So for me, I'll be comfortable in a situation whereby you only have one person speaking for the entire government. Mm. So that all these ministers, if they have something to say, let them channel it to that. And if journalists want to inquire something to do with the Ministry of Health, they will channel that, uh, the information to that person. And that person will say, well, if he doesn't know, he'll say, I'll have to check with the ministry. Because that person should be receiving information from various sources. And so that the, that information is managed so that there is no confusion and there is no miscommunication. Because clarity is very important. You don't want one minister saying, like we had in the last uh, government, where one minister says something because another minister says something. So you have complete chaos. You know, whilst information is valuable, not every information is valuable, but it has to be accurate and relevant for it to be meaningful and useful to the people. Right. So all those are things that, uh, the, the problem also with this government, I don't think that they have had a rethink. <clears throat> well, what they are doing is to say, they are not even checking. Why was there this ministry? Why was there that ministry? Why was this office? How well did it work? Because you can't replicate what the previous government has done. Okay? Yeah. That is why, for instance, I mean, yeah, it's a good thing they have, reconstituted certain ministries, uh, uh, created new ones, fine. But at the end of the day, the entire structure of government hasn't changed. It is still what PF left. Right. The only thing is that where there was Minister Bwadia, there is now Minister Banda. But there's been no radical change. And then you still say it's a new dawn government. Yeah. It can't be new dawn. Yeah. Let me, one or two very quick questions before we, we wind up. Um, President Chilema, you know, during the inauguration, saying it's not about transfer of power, it's about transfer of leadership, because power belongs to the people. But when they get into to government, we, we abrogate okay, that power. They take the power away, you know, from us. You were talking about the Constitution, that should not be driven by the government, it could still end up being driven by the government. What, do we let go of this power? No, we, no. We, I mean, we put this government, mm. into, the, the party into power, we've mm. done this before, mm. but at the end of the day, we turn into bystanders. Which we shouldn't, and that is why, I mean, you, you've, you have appeared on your show a couple of times. Yeah. I think this is my effort to try and make sure that citizens remain engaged yeah. in their affairs in, so that they know what is being done in their name. Yeah. You don't want to wake up one day to find that uh, the whole country, you, you, you begin to wonder, was this really done in my name? Yeah. Okay, so it is important for people to get engaged. Your responsibility as a citizen does not begin and end with a vote. A vote is simply the beginning of the process. You've put in a, a new government in place, which is fine. But get engaged, take a keen interest, you know, including how your MP is running, uh, what your MP is doing, what your councillors are doing. We need to take keen interest in, this, in these things. Now, the problem is that we vote and then we go in a coma. That is what is, is tragic. 
we have to hold uh, the government accountable and also to realize that government, we are the bosses, the people, we are the bosses. The president and all his cabinet ministers, they are all our servants. So even when they talk to us, they have to talk to us with humility, not with arrogance. Because we decide who becomes president. We decide who, who becomes MP uh, or councillor or mayor. So at the end of the day, we need, our people need to understand that the president and his cabinet work for us. We don't work for them. We are the masters. They are not the masters. We have put them there. We have given them a term of five years. If they don't perform like we did with PF, yeah. we remove them. They perform, we give them another chance. That is the need for people to understand the amount of power they wield, which was manifested itself on 12th of August. We were able to demonstrate the enormity of the responsibility that vests in people in as far as uh, when it comes to voting, the power of the vote, yeah. how we are able to harness that because we use it to change, to try and change the entire direction of the, of, uh, of, uh, the country. Now, whether the president will give effect to the mandate we gave him is another matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if he does it, well and good, but if he doesn't, we still retain the ultimate so, authority to decide who is president and who is not. Brilliant. We're going to end in with one combined question and very briefly, and there's a personal questions, one quick, two questions into, in, in, into one. Did it cross your mind, you know, when a couple of days, couple of months before the elections that, suppose PF win again? <laughs> what was going through your mind? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, I, and this is what Zambians need to understand, God loves this country. Not many countries have gone to the brink and recovered. Mm -hmm. I think the general consensus is that uh, if PF had won another five years, this, mm -hmm. <coughs> this country would have been totally finished. Okay? Nothing would have been left of this country. And people are just shuddering to imagine what this country would have been. Okay? And because what happened was, Government ceded powers to cadres. Cadres were running the country. And then as a result, you can't control cadres. And that is why I keep emphasizing, follow the Constitution, follow the Constitution. It is important to follow the Constitution because when you respect the Constitution, your powers are limited. You can only do that which is provided for by the Constitution. But once you break all the institutions of government and take power outside, that's a recipe for disaster. This country was going to be worse than Somalia. It was going to be, at the end of another five years, not even five years, it was going to be a failed state. Yeah. And that is what. So we are very fortunate, okay? We are very, very fortunate as a people and have no doubt that God loves this country so much. But what we must be mindful of, yeah. how often are we going to do that? Yeah. Okay? We survived in 91. We have now survived 30 years later in 2021. Mm. Okay? Now, because, because we had total collapse in 1991, now here also we had a complete collapse, but we survived by the ballot. But we were able to survive because uh, the vote still has value in this country. Now, for me, I don't want to live through this again. Yeah. We have, we t you, know, you know, it's like we are gamblers. We gamble with this country. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We have to stop gambling with this country because we may not be so fortunate. Yeah. Maybe the next government, the other government, I don't know which government will be there. Maybe we are going to have the worst government, a rogue government, which is going to push things to the brink, lose the election, and refuse to concede. Yeah. And before you know it, there's a breakdown of law and order, okay? We don't want to reach that level, okay? We need to have a situation whereby citizens are constantly engaged. Those in, in leadership realize that they work for the people and not vice versa, and they do what is right. We cannot constantly, this is one thing that Zambians must realize, we cannot constantly rely on the vote to rescue the country. 
Okay, we, we you you can't mess up everything, and then say oh all the institutions collapse because that's what happened. National Assembly collapse, the executive collapse, the judiciary collapse. The only thing that remained standing was people's vote. How many times are we going to Absolutely. do that? Was was it like you're going to be hanged, and then just before you're hanged, the hangman collapses? <laughs> I think that's that's basically the, the scenario because I mean um, I, I, some of us had even resigned to say if uh, PF wins yeah. we're looking at jail yeah. okay I prepared myself I planned for the worst case scenario yeah. okay I was ready for that and uh, somebody asked me to say well you're not afraid of dying and I said well if I died under those circumstances it is a worthy cause and then our naivety as a people is to believe that we can develop this country without paying the ultimate price okay if we can do it without sacrificing people's lives well and good but which we still can by simply respecting the constitution right but invariably we seem not to 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 get it right do i want to live through the experience or that i live through under pf for for five years no not in my lifetime i wouldn't want to go through that you know that was a a, a pure nightmare but it is very easy for such a situation to recreate itself if citizens go to sleep absolutely do you at times feel people regard you as controversial yeah i've heard those kind of accusations and others uh, accuse me to say i have an agenda or anything like that no i have no agenda if there is one agenda i have is you know i've been to school i can clearly see where the country is going yeah it would be wrong for me to keep quiet okay i warned president lungu in a letter on i think written on 9th september 2019 i warned him and i said mr president you have already done so much yeah. leave it forget this said them forget you dead forget this thing you have not been perfect but you have a legacy i emphasize legacy at the end of the day uh, when we are gone we'll be wondering to say what does the name frank mutubila symbolize what is your legacy mm -hmm. what have you left behind were you just there filling up space and you left no mark in this country or what or is there something that you're going to leave behind that people associate with you so i think when you reach a certain stage in your life you now begin to look for your legacy what is my legacy what am i leaving behind i won president lungu because i could see it and i said to him i mean this is very very clear in my letter where i said mr president whatever you choose remember one thing Zambian people are smarter than you think. I warned him that. I have the experience of following politics in this country for the last 30 years. I started practicing when Kaunda was president. I am now still practicing. We now have the seventh president. Okay. So I have a bit of understanding. I claim no expertise, but at least I have, I think, a reasonable knowledge and understanding of the political dynamics in this country. So when I see something going wrong, I think it would be wrong for me not to say something. Okay. So does that make me controversial? I don't know. Maybe in the eyes of certain people, but. It is wrong. What I don't want, you see, it's like you have a friend who has seen you going in a ditch, and you end up in the ditch, and then, but you didn't know that. And the friend comes up, by the way, I knew you were going to end up in a ditch. Of what value is that information? Yeah. That information is valuable. If somebody comes before you end up in a ditch and say, Mr. Pivina, if you proceed on this path, you end up in a ditch. That information is more valuable at that time, as opposed to when you're in a ditch. But at the end of the day, my job is to share this information it is up to the people to choose whether to accept it or not to accept it but at least nobody will claim if things go wrong that these issues were never discussed okay you and me are christians let's end on a, a christian note have you finally enrolled for not, not yet <laughs> I'm going to do that. I've been so busy. I've been so busy, but I'm going to.
I know the deadline is November, I think. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's been, uh, yeah, but I'll do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank God for driving this discussion. I really enjoy it. You know, I'd like to thank State Council John Sangwell for our discussion this evening on Frank on camera. I do thank, you know, the production team, Isaac and his his team, you know, Pastor Chiluba, Executive Director and Mrs. Ina Chiluba. On behalf of my my guests, I simply want to repeat what I keep on you know saying. This is your country. Do your bit. Do your very best and God will do the rest. That's right. Good night from all of us.